Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from Investor Stream, and I'll be your host today. Today, we have Fremont Petroleum CEO, Tim Hart, who's gonna provide us with an update on the company's decision to acquire 100% of Magnum Hunter Production Incorporated, uh, the operator of approximately 1,300 long-life, low-decline conventional natural gas wells located in Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee. Following the presentation, Tim will address any questions you may have. Uh, we've had a couple of questions already come through, which is greatly appreciated, and we'll attempt to get through as many questions as time permits. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them through. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can do it through the chat platform in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can also simply email them to me, alex at investorstream.com.au. You can also download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. I understand the presentation is also on the ASX. You can get it from there as well. And finally, a copy of the webinar will be available on Fremont's website and social media platforms later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Tim, who's gonna kick things off for us. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. I'd like to welcome you all to the discussion and, and thank you for your interest in Fremont. And, and for those of you who are supporters, uh, please know how grateful we are for your confidence in us and your continued support. And for those of you who are just being introduced to the company, we sincerely appreciate your interest and are, are looking forward to answering any questions that you may have. So we'll start this off with some details about our most recent acquisition of Magnum Hunter Production, which was announced on Tuesday. Uh, slide three, please. This acquisition is one of those once in a lifetime opportunities. And, and, and it's a true game changer for FPL. And, and here's why. It has substantial existing production. It's currently profitable. There is a enormous upside and everything required to run, operate, and advance the business is already in place. And so at a $425,000 acquisition price, uh, and, and, and that being non-dilutive, um, that is a, a huge win. And in summary, uh, you know, it really is a transformational acquisition. It, it increased our production by 10 times. Um, currently profitable, as I mentioned, and has plenty of runway for improvements not only from an operational and an efficiency standpoint, but also for the additional production opportunities that exist, all without a dilutive event. And so, um, and, and, and based on MHP's revenue alone, uh, Fremont's trading at two times revenue. So there's, uh, so there's a huge upside here and it's a huge win for the company. Um, just to give you a little bit of color on the existing production or that, that, we're, that we're gaining with MHP acquisition, there's 8 million cubic feet of gas, 16,000 gallons of liquids, 100 barrels of oil per day. And the, the important part to know about this is it's steady production. So it's already experienced its declines and it's gonna provide long-term cash flow for the company. Um, in terms of uh, the, the profitability, uh, it, it, right now it's, it's, a, it's, it's doing about a million dollars a month in gross revenue. And while that's positive, uh, there's a lot of upside that we'll be delivering quickly, and, and you'll understand that as we move through the presentation. Includes 1,300 wells, um, 85 or 80% of the production is coming from 25% of the wells, and that's important, so remember that fact. 63% of the field remains undeveloped, so there's lots of development opportunities if we were to choose to do that on a go forward. But the, there's a huge opportunity for production enhancements, and, and here's one example. So if 80% of the production is coming from 25% of the wells, there's at least a reasonable possibility that we could take one of these existing wells that came on at say 500,000 cubic feet per day and has since experienced a decline and it's now down to 10, 10 uh, MCF per day. We re, we stimulate it, we get even, even if we got even half of that production back at 250 MCF per day, um, if that is successful and you extrapolate that over the huge number of wells that are opportunities for such a stimulation, this could absolutely blow the roof off of this investment. And, and I can't overstate that. Um, 
there's a 35 person team that comes along with this acquisition and it, it's it's a very mature team if you do, if you look uh just at the leadership group uh, they have an average tenure of about 12 years and so they're very loyal people they're bought into the asset they know it very well uh, and they have welcomed us with open arms for a number of reasons um, there's 13 different long-term sales channels and so these things have been in place for for a while and uh, that's a good thing and all the equipment gathering systems pipelines compression stations trucks everything is present um, that it requires to run the business. So it's a turnkey outfit. Slide four, please. <clears throat> so you might ask how, how we got this and, and simply put, um, it was a, uh, a forgotten asset by a big shale player. And in order to understand that, let me give you a little background on MHP. So uh, MHP ended up in the hands of their previous parent company through several acquisitions. And, and those acquisitions were primarily due or done to enhance their footprint in two specific areas of the Appalachian Basin. And for those of you who are familiar with the Marcellus and the Utica formations, you might know that they're predominantly unconventional formations and they require long horizontals and multi-stage fracked wells and they're accompanied by significant production, but also a very large price tag. And so uh, MHP really doesn't fit that bill. And, and consequently, they, they were really never a core asset of the parent company. Um, and as a result, there, there was very little capital investment for the last, I don't know, six, seven years. Um, and, and it created a situation where it was lacking simple maintenance and repairs. Uh, the people, uh, when we walked in, you know, it was clear that they were substantially underappreciated. And, and quite frankly, to, to state it plainly, MHP was sort of dying a slow death. Um, and then COVID hit and, and the energy markets were upside down. And, and I will admit that we were a bit opportunistic when we approached them uh, in mid-2020. Uh, the majority of their production was shut down. Um, and, uh, you know, we entered into... Uh, uh, some discussions with them and, and the net of it is we were able to acquire the company um, along on this slide too one one other comment that i want to want to make about the uh, retirement obligations is um, you know these retirement obligations are spread out over a 50-year period and and we are only required to retire 10 wells per year so uh, while 1300 wells is is a big number um, uh, those retirement obligations uh, are are very well managed and so, what are we doing? Um, as you might imagine, with an actual, when it, with an acquisition like this, we're looking at absolutely everything. So, in the next 90 days, we're identifying all the operational inefficiencies and we're making improvements. And I just want to give you an idea of what I'm talking about there. And, and one example is oil collection. So, when we acquired MHP, uh, there were not enough drivers and trucks to collect the oil fast enough, which created a reduction in in oil production just because we couldn't move the oil fast enough so uh, some of the problems that we're incurring and solving are as simple as hiring a driver and getting a truck those are the kinds of things that uh, that I'm going to call low-hanging fruit that uh, that are being addressed that are going to have a material impact on production improvements um, we're also scrutinizing every sales contract for economic gains there's plenty of them uh, developing additional plans for production enhancements and and we're we're also executing uh an existing production enhancement plans that we've already identified and just to give you some color on that those are simple repairs and maintenance procedures uh just things that have been neglected in the past like pipeline repairs uh swabbing wells pulling water off of the wells so that we can liberate the gas uh all you know simple well workovers to bring additional wells back online all very very simple uh simple things um, slide five, please. So this gives you some idea of the location of the assets and, and, uh, uh, and you'll see on, uh, uh, the next slide images of the infrastructure, infrastructure, but a couple of things to note here. Um, there is massive upside. Um, uh, today, uh, MHP and now FPL is one of the five largest gas producers in Kentucky. 
And, and so what you're looking at here is what 1300 gas wells looks like. And what I see are 1300 opportunities to grow production without ever having to drill. Um, and so again, I wanna reiterate that the real excitement here is the upside potential of a more aggressive well program. And um, historically, this field has produced uh, more than double of, of what it's doing today. Um, and again, 80% of the production coming from, you know, from 25% of the wells. Slide six, please. So just a couple of images uh, of the operation and, uh, and where the folks work out of. Slide seven. So what, what I want to draw your attention to slide seven for just a moment. So this shows all of the Fremont acreage in the Illinois and the Appalachian Basin. And it totals about 106,000 acres. Uh, the red shaded areas are the, are the tray uh, exploration leases, which represent about 4,600 acres. Uh, the green areas are the uh, legacy Kentucky exploration acreage. It totals about 1,000 acres. And uh, the yellow area is the new MHP uh, acreage, which is about 100,000 acres. So you can sort of see um, that our focus, you know, at the at the moment is uh, in these two basins and uh, and kind of consolidated mostly in Kentucky, but also uh, Indiana, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia as well to uh, to a lesser degree. Slide eight. So that's a good lead in to uh, another asset that we procured in late uh, 2020, which is tray exploration. And, and although Trey is not on the same scale as MHP, these assets are a great example of the kind of assets that are perfectly aligned with our acquire, enhance, and produce strategy. And, and here's why. And, and please prepare yourself because this is going to be uh, sort of sounding like a broken record. It has existing production. It's currently profitable. There is significant upside. And everything required to run, operate, and advance the business is already in place. So let me give you a little bit of color on that. Um, when we acquired Trey, we acquired it at about 70 barrels of oil per day. It was steady production. It had already experienced its declines uh, so that it was providing long-term cash flow. Um, currently profitable. Lifting costs are approximately $39 a barrel. Uh, there's 115 wells in the Trey portfolio and 80% of the production is coming from about 30% of the wells. And so again, there's lots of opportunity for production enhancements and much of the, the field remains undeveloped. Uh, it, 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 uh, it has a two person team, the leadership average tenure is about 12 years, uh, existing long-term sales channels in place. And, and again, all equipment gathering systems, pipelines, pump jacks, et cetera, all in place, uh, all ready to go, all ready to generate revenue. So, so how did we get it? And let me give you some background on Trey as well. Um, so these assets were put together over a period of about 10 years by a senior geologist uh, who spent all of his life in, the, in this area, in the Illinois Basin. And, and his primary cr criteria for adding assets to his production portfolio were that they were underdeveloped, um, they were located in the most prolific areas of the basin, they all have a good history of accurate well information, and this is really kind of critical in this part of the this part of the world. Um, and they had a significant amount of original oil left in place. So, and that strategy led to the assembly of the 4,600 acres that we acquired from Trey. And although every one of the leases in this portfolio are good, there, there are a couple of standout plays that I, that I just wanted to sort of go over uh, now. And, and one of them is the Mount Carmel East Field. So this is 1,374 acres in Knox County, Indiana. Um, it's one of the largest underdeveloped leases in the area. Uh, total remaining reserves estimated to be about one and a half million barrels of oil. And recent uh, refracking of some of the wells in the area uh, has, has yielded some, sometimes in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 barrels of oil per day. So there's some real potential uh, upside for, uh, for some, some significant finds here. Um, the, the second asset and the second standout play that I'd like to reference is the North Hanson oil field. So that's 1,300 acres in Hopkins County, Kentucky. Um, that was previously owned by Exxon USA. You might have heard of them. 
Uh, total remaining reserves in this field is about 3 million barrels of oil, and it has seven producing formations. Um, and so we're very, very excited about that field as well. Um, let's talk about what we're doing uh, with Trey. So in January, we began a workover program that included 21 workovers, and we're currently right in the middle of this effort. Um, and, and we've been able to increase production by about 25%. So we're meeting those estimated production increases. And, and if I just look at the workovers that have occurred to date, um, we're, we're yielding uh, about a six month or less ROI. Uh, and, and that's about a $5,000 per barrel uh, cost. And, and those were our targets and, and those, are, those are what we're hitting. So this program uh, will conclude in the next 90 days and we're interested to uh, report back on its success, but early indications certainly are uh, that this Trey acquisition uh, is, is meeting our expectations for why we acquired it. Slide nine, please. So, um, the key takeaway here with this slide is that there are nine different producing formations in the field at depths between 1,800 and 3,000 feet. And so that's a lot of opportunities for oil at very shallow depths, which is one of the reasons that we like this area. Um, and, and admittedly, we're deliberately, de we're deliberately light on, on geology uh, today because the primary focus of this is uh, is about achieving these production gains in the first 90 days. And, and we'll come back with more detail on the geology after we complete a few of these frack jobs so we can better show the, up, uh, the upside and, and decline curves, uh, et cetera. Slide 10, please. So to wrap up here, you know, both the MHP assets and the tray assets are very well aligned uh, with our strategy of acquire, enhance, and produce and, and, and we've got a near-term goal to increase our production, our total production by about 20% in the next 90 days. Um, we're currently tracking at about 240 barrels of oil per day, and, and the near-term target is somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 barrels. Um, and, and once we deliver this, then we'll move to uh, a second phase uh, of a more aggressive kind of re-stimulation, refracture program uh, to realize even more potential from the 75% of the wells that uh, that we have that are not delivering. Um, it's important to note though that you know we are still operating in Colorado. Uh, we have our Colorado field, we're producing in that Colorado field. Um, we have uh, certainly spent a long time, a lot of time in the Colorado field working to develop uh, a gas contract um, with an off taker there. Um, that uh, gas contract and those discussions have not died by any stretch of the means. Um, we're dealing with a very large company. There's been some turnover. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, some uh, some changes uh, due to the COVID. Uh, but uh, but as recently as last week, um, we have uh, exchanged uh, additional dialogue uh, with this company about uh, the possibility of moving forward with that gas contract. So um, more to come uh, on, uh, on, on what happens there, but, uh, but please know that the Colorado's, Colorado assets are, are still very much alive and in the works. Slide 11, please. So basically, um, let me, uh, let me end with our model. Um, and you know it's it's based on what we set out to achieve last year. and and we're we're setting ourselves apart by by being an ASX listed company that produ that that grows production in this way. Um, we're not betting the farm on drilling. It's all about building a growing and and predictable revenue base. Uh, very similar to uh, to dGO and 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 you'll see pretty soon how we're taking more steps. Uh, with the assets we have to become the next DGO. So, um, so that that concludes the the presentation, uh, and I'll turn it back over to Alex to help uh, facilitate the the Q and A portion of the webinar. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, I think everyone got a, a fair bit out of that. So we have had a number of questions come through, Tim. Um, now the first one. Um, refers to the, the actual tenements and leases themselves. Do the 1,300 tenements and leases 
have an expiry date and what is FPL's continuing security of tenure arrangements for the majority? So um, all of the acreage uh, that we have, every bit of acreage that we have uh, is held by production. And so, so long as the wells are producing, uh, we are entitled to produce them. And uh, in every one of those uh, lease agreements, we also have appropriate shut-in provisions uh, to accommodate anything that's unforeseen. So, um, so we're in pretty good shape there. Is there clear early local demand to increase gas supply to existing clients and new clients in the event that early workovers of the MHP tenements start producing significant production increases? Absolutely. So, so we're in an area that, um, that has plenty of demand for oil and gas. Um, we could easily triple our production and sell every cubic foot of gas and every barrel of oil uh, that we produce. So it, we're in a very, very good area of the country for this. Tim, can you just talk about uh, what you think may be required from a maintenance point of view and other works potentially to get the 1300 wells up to an optimal producing state. Um, what are we talking about in terms of time and costs involved? Well, um, to <clears throat> that's a bit of a loaded question because um, what we're doing is uh, we, we are getting as much production on as we possibly can. Um, through, you know, through simple measures, through, uh, you know, rebuilding pipelines or, you know, pipeline repairs, um, uh, you know, um, repairing roads to get to wells that, you know, that we haven't been able to get to for a while. Um, you know, all of the kind of the low hanging fruit type maintenance activities that, um, that are easily achievable for the lowest cost possible so that we can get as much production as early as possible as we can. Um, that said, that that wouldn't achieve a goal of getting all 1,300 wells on. Uh, in fact, some of the wells, uh, you know, we, we will not bring back online, and some of them will be allocated for, uh, you know, for additional, uh, more significant workovers. So, uh, but all low-hanging fruit, all uh, will be funded out of uh, existing revenues um, and all, uh, you know, quick lifts in production. Tim, do you think the the or will the Biden administration moratorium on federal lands, which uh, is a 60-day halt on ground disturbing activities, have any impact on the future plan workover programs for the MHP or tray assets? Not not at all. Um, most of the um, uh, most of the federal lands uh, are in in the West, and and, and we have absolutely no. Uh, no acreage on federal lands uh, anywhere in in FPL. So there's uh, there's absolutely zero impact uh, for that moratorium. So could you talk us through how much revenue is being earned from each of the the three categories: the the gas, the NG, NGLs, and oil? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, the uh, the distribution of of revenue is, and this is on a, a monthly basis, and I'm going to talk um, U.S. dollars. Uh, forgive me for that. It's uh, it's what I've been looking at recently. But um, uh, give me one second, Alex. Okay. Um, so uh, we're, we're producing uh about nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars in gas and this is on a monthly basis us dollars um a hundred thousand dollars in liquids and about a hundred and twenty six thousand in uh in oil so um that should be uh for, for uh, that should be about the distribution, Alex. That uh, that that we're looking at. Um, yeah. So you've made ref reference to the sixteen thousand uh, gallons of NGLs. Can you talk us through what percentage of that is saleable? 
Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, so there's about 80% of our NGLs that are saleable um, with, with nearly 20% of that being ethane, which, uh, which, which doesn't have any market value at all. Okay, so um, th we just had this one come through, Tim. Can you just tell us what DGO is? Yeah, so so DGO um, is a is a company that's listed um, on the London Exchange, um, uh, diversified gas and oil. They have an enormous presence in the U.S. Um, their uh, their model is exactly what our model is. Um, you know, they look at uh, uh, underperforming assets that are non-conventional, um, uh, and and they basically acquire those assets, and and they've built a a very significant company in that way. Um, I think their market cap somewhere in the neighborhood of two billion dollars, um, and and they've got an enormous presence, uh, enormous presence right here, and um, uh, and 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 quite frankly, they had an an interest in this MHP asset. Um, and they were one of the uh, one of the folks that we were in competition with to get it. Fantastic, uh, Tim. Now, just another one that, that's come through. So the announcement refers to 100, bar 100 barrels of oil, uh, which equals 17, approximately 1,700 barrels barrels of oil per day. Can you talk us through how these numbers correlate to each other, and how many barrels are saleable? So at a high level, um, barrels of oil equivalent per day, uh, you know, those are that's all three of the components. That's oil, that's um, that's gas, and the liquids. Um, and so uh, all of it, uh, you know, all of it, uh, all of the oil is 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 saleable. Um, again, uh, the only the, there's a small component of the gas that goes towards um, uh, operation of the equipment, uh, the compressor stations and things like that, and there's a little bit of shrink attached to it. Um, and then, of course, uh, about 20% um, of the NGLs are, are ethane. Forgive me for not having specific uh, answers on that, but uh, uh, but but that's the uh, that's the distribution. Tim, can you provide us a bit more detail on the four fracks that you've referenced in the deck? What's the plan and time frame, and has the first one kicked off? Um, the, the 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 four fracks that are referenced in the deck, uh, it, it probably wouldn't surprise anybody to know that two of them are in the Hans and in, in the uh, the North Hanson field. Um, one of them is in the Mount Carmel East field. And, and one of them is uh, a legacy Kentucky exploration property. Um, and, and all four of them are, um, are progressing at this time. Uh, my anticipation is that the first one could potentially start by the end of this week with another one following next week uh, and, and likely a third uh, the following week. But, but all four of them uh, will be done within that 90 day window that uh, that we're targeting for uh, for completion of these workover programs. This next question, Tim, is a uh, a bit of an extension of the uh, the one earlier about the Biden administration moratorium. Do you see any issues with the current government's attempt to move away from natural energy, and do you think it could possibly hinder production? Uh, well, I, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody on this call that there's a there's a you know there's a push um, in in the U.S. and 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 quite frankly worldwide to go to renewable energy sources. But um, but but the reality of it is that you know we're not in a position to do that anytime soon. Um, in fact, uh, quite the contrary. I think that the exercise that the world is going through right now with non-renewable um, is uh, is allowing uh, a lot of people to see, uh, you know, that oil and gas is going to be around for a long, long time. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, th there's lots of um, demand for it here in the U.S. Uh, we are not in any jeopardy at all of being impacted in any way. Um, 
uh, with, uh, with any other energy source other than our oil and gas that we have right now. Tim, can you provide a bit of insight into how FPL plan to run the two key tray and MHP tenements together to gain early net revenue growth potential from each? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as as you bring companies together like that and you have uh, varying degrees of expertise, you know, we're, we're looking at um, uh, we're we're looking at all of the um, uh, all of the folks that we have, and uh, you know, we're 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 sharing information, um, and, um, and 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 you know, we're we're going to build the team uh, in such a way that you know uh, we have the right management structure in place, and that management structure uh, is going to be responsible for all facets of the business, and so. Um, uh, certainly with the MHP acquisition, having uh, 35 employees, uh, there is a tremendous amount of benefit uh, for having uh, those uh, experts uh, on staff to, uh, to help us develop and execute on the other programs uh, with some of the smaller business units that, we, uh, uh, that, you know, that, we've, that we've referenced, including Trey. So this is just following on from uh, the slide about the infrastructure. Um, do, does FPL have the ability to sell gas interstate via that established pipeline infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. Um, FPL has access um, to a number of, uh, of pipelines. In fact, we have uh, some optionality on uh, which way to move the gas. The most attractive um, market that we sell into is uh, Transco Zone 5, which is um, which is East Tennessee, and the good part about that is that um, uh, they have a uh, an elevated um, uh, uh, price over over NYMEX uh, in the winter, and that can be very substantial in terms of uh, in terms of revenue. So, um, however, you know we we can sell into different markets as well, and, and we do have access to uh, to the majority of the markets in the U.S. So just on the net revenue interest, uh, which is 73%, um, does this literally mean that FPL's interest in all the revenue is 73%? And if so, where does the other 27% go? Uh, I understand in the announcement, the company said it was looking at ways to increase that 73% NRI. Is the figure negotiable with MHP, notwithstanding it is stated in the contract? So, um, so MHP uh, has a, uh, a net mineral interest of 73%, and um, and the other 27% goes to other mineral interest owners. Um, and and what we uh, were trying to communicate there was that uh, we are actively pursuing another of a, a number of other working interest partners that uh, that seem likely to sell uh, or relinquish their interest um, because. Uh, with the working interest partners, then they they certainly share in the um, in the costs uh, of the operation as well, and uh, and in some cases there's an appetite for that. But what I'm finding is that uh, there are uh, some working interest partners that uh, that really don't have an interest in it, and so um, where that uh, you know where those two uh, roads cross, then we're looking at uh, at bringing on those additional uh, uh, interests. Well, you referenced the, the average working interest there, which is uh, 87%. Am I correct in saying that FPL is responsible for 87% of all outgoings, both capital costs and operational costs? And if so, is MHP paying the remaining 13%? And if not, where's that coming from? So uh, the answer is yes. And, and you know, generally speaking, uh, since our working interest is 87%, uh, then MHP is responsible for 87% of the costs. Uh, the other 13% of the costs are shared with our with our other working interest partners, and so um, you know while we're not we're not footing the bill for 100% of it, um, uh, you know we 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 certainly are responsible for the costs of uh, of all of the working interest uh, with uh, 87%. Okay, so so just so just so I'm, we're all clear. Um, 
FPL have an interest of 80, uh, sorry, FPL have an interest of 73% of all revenue, but is responsible for 87% of all outgoings, both capital and operational expenses. Is that correct? Yeah, as is common, the you know the working interest partners cover the uh, expenses for the for the non-working interest mineral owners. So that that would be a, a correct statement, Alex. Thanks, Tim. So, do you see any other business purchases in the near term? Well, um, <laughs> we you know our our focus is certainly these two assets. Um, and and there's a lot of work to do, and there is a lot of upside that we can realize uh, from both Trey and MHP. And so, um, uh, you know, we we don't have any um, any significant effort ongoing right now uh, to do any more acquisitions um, because we're so uh, laser focused on on realizing the full potential of what we've already acquired. Um, but you know, I, I guess I, I would leave that with, uh, you know, neither would I uh, not, you know, um, uh, you know, at least look at uh, other potential opportunities at some at some stage in the future. But but right now, Alex, uh, you know, 100 percent of our focus is are these assets because there's so much value to be realized. Now, Tim, you may have touched this on, on this before, but I'd just like to confirm. Um, can you comment on what price rates FPL is getting for gas? Yeah, um, so it, it's it's based on NYMEX, um, and so that's the index that uh, you know that we that we primarily use. But uh, but more specific, it's Transco Zone Five, and so um, that is a you know a very mature and and well understood index here in the U.S. And so I would um, I would point to uh, uh, to uh, you know some of the facilities that are publicly available to go look and see what uh, how that uh, Transco Zone Five is tracking. Now, to, other than yourself, what other FPL personnel are currently living and working in the U.S., not including X Tray and XMHP personnel? Um. <laughs> well, we're 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 a pretty slim team. <laughs> um, uh, we, we've we've only got a handful of people, uh, uh, Alex, that are that are here uh, living in the U.S. We've got uh, one person that's running the uh, the Colorado operation. We've got one person that's responsible for the Kentucky exploration operation. Uh, uh, you know, there are uh, two people that. Uh, that look after the the tray exploration operation and myself and uh, and then uh, MHP. So, uh, what is uh, what is Transco Zone Five paying at the moment? Um, it, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of. Um, two probably two ninety. Okay. Sorry, Alex. I don't. Um, I don't have that uh, readily available here. No, uh, that, that's that's okay, Tim. Um, and just so, when do you expect to have majority of workovers complete? Can and just a an, an approximate timeline, if you can. Yeah, the the majority of the workovers will be completed. Um, as I mentioned here, in in the in the next uh, ninety days, uh, and and I would anticipate that um uh that uh the the tray workovers would would be more along the lines of the next 60 days because we've already been uh, engaged in that project for some time um we did have some delays uh, as a result of the um of the very difficult uh, north american winter that we had that's uh, very impactful in in uh, this time of year and so uh, there were uh, we lost a, a few weeks uh, of uh, of time due to the due to the winter and just finally, Tim, uh, you you referenced some numbers previously. Um, referenced them as uh, as US dollars. Uh, one of the one of our attendees has uh, pointed out that uh, it may, you may have must have referenced in AUD, given that you're currently doing approximately Australian Australian a um, million dollars a month. 
um, and they just want to know what the split is between um, it, the split between is it eighty percent gas or sixteen percent NGLs, etc. Yeah, so um, so so that's one of the challenges with doing a doing a live interview and, and not having the luxury to see uh, the questions beforehand. I'm I'm pulling information uh, from different sources to try and answer as best as I can on a live interview, but. Uh, but you know, but in general, uh, it's 77% gas, 22% NGLs, and 2% oil. Uh, those those numbers that I that I referenced earlier um, are, are not uh, fully baked and, and fully thought through. So uh, so please accept my apologies for uh, for not having a better, uh, more um, uh, more readily available uh, answer for that. No, that, that that's fine, Tim. You're doing you're doing a, a fantastic job, and uh, and agree. It is it's always a little bit hard when you don't have the, the questions beforehand. Uh, we just have one final one, and then we'll uh, we'll probably leave it there. Um, and it's a it's a, a question that you've sort of dealt with previously with uh, with some other um, allusions to uh, government um, regulations and things like that. In terms of Colorado, with the regulatory environment there at present, there's a clear push to green energy. How are you mitigating against this? And can you deliver a green energy solution with your gas there? Yeah, so Alex, this is something that we are, um, that we're uh, investigating uh, right now are, are different opportunities for us to, um, uh, to engage in uh, technology that will help us um, uh, you know, do something with the gas out there and and offer a solution that is uh, you know appropriate for for the locale. Um, and so um, uh, we are actively pursuing um, a couple of different uh, of different um, technologies that that are potentials, um, which uh, uh, you know and and as those dis uh, those discussions develop, I'll I'll be interested to. Uh, uh, to share those with the market. Thanks, fantastic, Tim. Look, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much, Tim. You've you've uh, you've done a very uh, done a sensational job, in my opinion, um, trying to, uh, to to deal with all these questions. We we went through well over twenty, which is which has been um, uh, which has been really great. So, uh, oh, firstly, obviously, uh, Tim, thank you very much for uh, presenting and taking the time to uh, answer some questions. Um, now. Tim, before I let you go, do you have any final comments you want to leave us leave with us today? Yeah, yeah, and thanks for that opportunity, Alex. Um, I I guess I just want to, I, you know, from my perspective, um, this direction that the company is taking with uh, these acquisitions of, you know, existing production um enhancements uh it, it you know it's 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 way more certain of an approach than um than you know to to drill uh a well that is a million plus and um and taking the chance on that well so and and i really do think that this approach and and i think the shareholders will agree uh in time uh has been the right approach because uh now what you're going to see is um, a, a significant focus on, uh, you know, cash flow and enhancements of that cash flow, and and uh, and much better financials in the future. So, um, so I've never been more excited about the direction uh, that we're going in right now, um, and also, uh, you know, the asset base that we have at this time. So, um, look forward to delivering the results to the shareholders and and updating the market uh, as those results are realized. Fantastic, Tim. Uh, again, thanks very much for uh, for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions for us. Um, as I mentioned before, the, a recording of the webinar will be on Fremont's website and social media platforms later today. Um, and that wraps it up for us. So, Tim, have a great uh, evening over there in, in, in Colorado. And um, again, thanks very much for uh, presenting for us. Thank you, Alex.